sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath a cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. Plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in Jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me Plunged me to victory beneath his cleansing flood. Not I, but Christ. Be
live out thy life within me, Jesus King of kings, be thou thyself the answer to all my questionings, live out thy The temple has been yielded and purified of sin. Let thy shekin and glory now shine forth from within, and all the earth keep silence upon its fourth day. servant moved only as by thee. Its members every moment held subject to thy call, ready to have thee use them or not be used at all. Held without restless longing, or strain, or stress, or fret, or chafings at thy dealings, or thoughts of vain or regret, but restful, calm, and pliant from bend and bind. Be thou the glorious answer to all my questions. In the biblical gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, it is written, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. You see, the weighty truth of God's word are for those who are humble and willing to learn at the feet of the divine teacher. Jesus rejoiced in spirit because of this fact and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Please know this, dear friends, that it has seemed good in the Lord's sight to be graciously revealing his glorious truths of the Bible even to us as babes of AHA at study each week. By God's grace, may none of us ever leave his feet unenlightened or unchanged. Greetings, AHA at study.
It is such a joy to once again welcome everyone to our study time together here at AHA. Whatever your time zone, platform, nationality, or occupation, if your heart is hungering for the divine truth, if it is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then you are here with us by divine appointment and Jesus himself welcomes you to join us as we are all privileged to sit now at his feet to hear and heed his words. Once again, welcome. This is Brother Aaron co-hosting with Sister Dahana. Our theme, which has been a series, and this is part six, we're looking at the law and the commandments. And now I ask that everyone seek a position of reverence as Pastor Robert Wright offers the invocation. Heavenly Father, we are grateful once again for the privilege that you have afforded us to come together to study your word. We open our hearts and we invite your Holy Spirit in. We ask for cleansing. We pray that you will make your word simple and meaningful to our hearts as we listen and as we share with each other. Do magnify your name in our study today and bring souls, bring us all closer to you for in knowing you is salvation. And we thank you so much for hearing and for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our speaker, as you've just heard, is none other than Pastor Robert Wright, also doctor. He is an assistant professor in the School of Religion and Theology at Northern Caribbean University, where he also serves as the director of the Ellen White Research Center. He is also now our pastoral sponsor by endorsement here at AHA. He will be the one facilitating our study this evening right after our opening hymn, which has been our theme song, Are You Ready for Jesus to Come? Please listen and ponder, are we ready? Are we really ready for Jesus to come? Even though we see many things that are taking place in the world today, the question that we need to answer is, are we ready for Jesus to come? Please mute and sing along. Stand in your place. 
biblical signs of his coming are being fulfilled everywhere. Results of earth's evil are looming, their brethren don't we to come. Are you faithful in all that you do? Have you fought a good fight? Have you stood for the right? Have others in Jesus in you? stand in your place? Are you ready to look in his face? Can you look up and see this is my Lord? Are you ready for Jesus to to this world and its treasure, this earth shall soon pass away. Friend, give him your love without measure, he's calling you today. Are you ready for Jesus to come? faithful in all that you do? Do you fight a good fight? Do you stand for the right? Do others see Jesus in me and you? Are you ready to stand in your place? Are you ready to look in his face? Can you look up and see this is my Lord? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Brother Aaron, Sister Dehanna, and our only guest so far. Uh, today, we are wrapping up our study on the series, The Law and the Commandments. And uh, our study today is focused on the mark of the beast because it has to do with God's commandments. And uh, there are many theories in Christendom as to what the mark of the beast is. And um, what we need to be strictly biblical in seeking to understand what it is. Uh, the many fanciful, um, you know, theological rhetoric are mostly uh, not anchored on the scriptural narrative. And uh, there are many, you know, scary presuppositions and statements as to what it really is. But it, it really is a simple phenomenon. It has to do with obedience or disobedience. It has to do with worshiping God or not worshiping God. And uh, the scriptures uh, reveal to us all that God requires of us. And Satan always has a counterfeit to God's truth. So by looking at what God's truth says and uh, comparing it with what Lucifer's position is, you can detect um, the counterfeit uh, in, in everything that God has posited pertaining to our salvation. Lucifer has a counterfeit to that. So when the scripture talks about the seal of God in the forehead, 
Lucifer has a counterfeit to that, which is the mark of the beast in the forehead. And uh, notice that God, the seal that God mentions is in the forehead only. It refers to character development. It refers to the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds. But with the mark of the beast, not only is the mark in the forehead, it's on the hand as well, suggesting work. Uh, where our salvation is concerned, it does not entail our working for salvation. So you don't see a seal on the hand where God's people are concerned. It's simply a mark or a seal in the forehead. It's about our character, the frontal lobe of the brain there, the forehead. It's about a choice to serve God, to worship him. Hence, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Last time we looked at the sealing in, of Revelation 7, and we saw that the Holy Spirit does the sealing. The Holy Spirit secures his people. The Holy Spirit perfects the, um, the character of Jesus Christ in the hearts of his people. It's a seal or sign of security, of genuineness, of acceptance, of character. So today, that's what we're going to be looking at, the mark of the beast versus the seal of God. And I, I do hope our regular participants will join us um, very early in our presentation. So let's go through our study um, this evening. Now, in Revelation 13 and 17, uh, the two chapters present the beast that uh, is the political power on which the woman sits. The woman represents the church. In Revelation chapter 13, the beast is the composite of all the beasts that are mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. And the same thing is seen in Revelation 17, the beast with seven heads and ten horns. But this time in chapter 17, a woman is seen straddling the beast, riding the beast. And we know in scripture that a woman represents a church. An apostate woman represents the apostate church. This is usually, this, uh, the scripture usually uses the term um, a whore or harlot or a prostitute. Uh, the, 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 the true worshipers of God, the true church of Jesus Christ, is referred to as a comely and delicate woman. And in Revelation 19, she is presented as the bride of the groom, Jesus Christ. So uh, we're going to see in this study today that uh, this beast power is under the control of the woman, the church, and it is this alliance that will seek to bring the world to its knees in the worship of Lucifer. And those who will not bow are slated to suffer serious persecution, even death. Now, let's take a look at the beast. The first line of business is to, one, identify the beast, two, decide on the mission of the beast, and finally, identify its authoritative distinctiveness or mark of authority, and compare this with God's authentic sign or mark. So, identity of the beast, what does the Bible say? The first mention of beasts in the apocalyptic books of Daniel and Revelation is found in Daniel chapter 7. There, the prophet identifies four beasts that represent world empires in sequence. The first one <clears throat> is a lion representing Babylon, which reigned from 605 to 539 BC. The second is a beer representing Medo Persia, which reigned from 539 BC to 331 BC. Then there was the leopard representing Greece, which reigned from 331 BC to 168 BC. And then a monster beast with 10 horns representing Rome. This beast, John could not describe it. There was nothing like it in nature. So it reigned from 168 BC to 476 AD. <clears throat> All right, so that's Rome. 
Now, the fourth beast was different and very terrible. It had huge iron teeth. It devoured broken pieces, trampled the residue underfoot. A little horn on its head eventually controlled the beast. This little horn we know to be the papal power. This horn was arrogant in speech. It persecuted God's people and it tried to change God's times and laws. We did a study on that before. When next this beast appeared in apocalyptic prophecy, it was in Revelation 13 and 17. In 13, it has all the features of the beasts that Daniel described in chapter 7. It had the seven heads and ten horns, a blasphemous name, body of a leopard, the mouth of a lion, the feet of a bear, and the dragon, Satan, gives it its power, its throne, and great authority. So let's quickly run back to show you that beast that we mentioned earlier on. So here is that beast that has the body of a leopard. It has the feet of a bear. You notice the feet there of the bear. It has the mouth of a lion. It has seven heads and ten horns. It's coming up out of the sea. Sea represents the multitudes of people. All right. So this is a global empire and it represents Rome. And uh, the dragon gave it its seat, its throne, and great authority. Now, this beast suffered a deadly wound, but the wound eventually healed, and all the world worshipped the beast. That is coming. That's yet, yet future, according to Revelation 13, 8. In Revelation 17, the beast is presented as a scarlet-colored red beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. A whorish woman, dressed in scarlet, and purple, decked with precious stones, rides the beast. She is drunken with the blood of the saints and is called Mystery, Babylon, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now, as we said earlier on, a beast represents a political power and a woman represents a religious power, a church. So what we see here in this description is a union of church and state. And it is the, the, the church that is controlling the state. The, the one who rides the beast controls the beast. The ten horns on this beast give their power and authority to the beast in a show of support and alliance. These together make war with the lamb by persecuting the remnant people of God. So we see here an alliance of a beast power with many other political powers from around the world, and a woman, a church that has global influence and control. All right? So, according to Revelation 17, there are seven identifying marks of this woman. Let's look at them. Uh, she sits on a scarlet-colored beast. That's verse 3 of Revelation 17. The woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet. That's her official colors. That's the church, okay? Uh, the, woman, the woman is named Mystery, Babylon, the mother of harlots. Once you see Babylon, you're talking about a system of rebellion against God. Throughout the history of the Babylons, old ancient Babylon, Genesis 11, and Neo-Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, they both resisted God's authority and God's power. They were both uh, systems of rebellion. So this spiritual Babylon, mother of harlots, is also a system of uh, uh, a rebellious system. And the fact that she is mother of harlots, remember we say a harlot is an apostate church. And if she is the mother, then there are many apostate religious systems, and she is the mother of them all. It could also mean that she is the chief of them all. All right. So we're looking at the Seven identifying marks of the woman, the, the apostate church, um, as given in Revelation 17. So she sits on a scarlet-colored beast. 
she is arrayed in purple and scarlet. So the beast is scarlet and she also wears scarlet. Uh, her name is Mystery Babylon. It's a spiritual um, um, uh, body, mother of harlots. And uh, number four, she is drunk with the saints' blood, the blood of the saints, which means that she's a persecuting power. And uh, if you read the history of the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the history of Rome, you will see uh, how you know accurate this description is. She really killed of the over a thousand year history that she has millions of God's people because they refused to bow to her authority. Then number five, the woman sits on seven hills. Now this is identifying the geographical location of the church, the woman. And accurately, the woman is located in Rome, which is built on seven hills. So when you put all of these descriptions together, uh, there, there can, there's only one power that fits all of these descriptions as given in Revelation 17. Number six, the woman sits on many waters, which are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. This is the one church that has a global reach and global influence, global authority over the nations of the world. And number seven, the woman is a great city that rules globally. Uh, verse 15 of Revelation 17. She is that city, that little city. She, so the woman is a church and she is a city. She is a state. All right. And that uh, applies to the Vatican. Vatican City, which is also the headquarters of the church. So it's a church state union. And all of these description fit only one power. And that's the Roman power. And if you look at the way the, the cardinals and the bishops are dressed, they are in scarlet and purple, as described in Revelation 17. These are their official colors, scarlet and purple. That's the woman that rides the beast. Okay, now let's look at the mission of the beast, which is to secure worship for Lucifer. According to Revelation 13, verse 4, those who marveled and wondered after the healed beast worshipped the dragon who had given authority to the beast. And also they worshipped the beast. Later in the same chapter, a second beast arises and deceives people to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So here's the Roman church state union, which is revived again. And in Revelation 12, the second beast represents America and American Protestantism that uh, makes an image to the first beast. So the first beast is a union of church and state. That's Catholicism and politics. The second beast is also a union of church and state, the political system of America and the Protestants, the apostate Protestant churches form an alliance. So the American system of church-state union is an image of the first beast system of church-state union as well. And the two are going to come together to get the world to worship the beast, the first beast, and in so doing worship Lucifer. Because remember in chapter 13, verse 2, it says, the dragon gave it, the first beast, its seat, its throne, and great authority. So it is working on behalf of the dragon. The dragon is empowering it and is using it to accomplish its, its uh, ends. Now, keep in mind that the worship of the first beast was presented earlier as the worship of Lucifer, the dragon. So the mission of the beast is to get the world to worship the dragon, Lucifer. Remember, the final um, contention, the final conflict is going to be about worship. Whether we worship God and keep his commandments, or we worship Lucifer and take the mark of the beast, the mark of his so-called authority. And ultimately, those who receive the seal of God will be protected from the wrath of God, which is coming, the seven last plagues, whereas those who take the mark of the beast or manifest allegiance or alliance with the second, with uh, Lucifer or the beast will suffer the wrath of God, the seven last plagues. Now, let's look at uh, 
the mark of the beast, his sign of authority. What does the beast say that is his sign of authority in comparison to what God says is the sign of his authority? The mark or name or number of the beast is said to be the number of a man, Revelation 13, 18. That name is encrypted in a numerical format. The number is the name of a man, and it is the number or name of the beast. So the man here is identified as one with the beast. The man controls the church. The church controls the political power. The man is in charge of all of these. Now, how do we generate um, this name from a number. The method of reading generally adopted is that which is known as gematria of the rabbis, which assigns each letter of a name its usual numerical value and gives the sum of such numbers as the equivalent of the name. Okay? And that's the reference there. So therefore, the, we find that uh, the name uh, the number of the man is derived from a name that is encrypted on the mitre that the Pope wears. We're going to see that. The number is the number of the man of sin of Thessalonians 2, the little horn of Daniel 7, and the beast of Revelation 13. The letters, this is from um, Catholic writing, the letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these, vicarious filiae Day, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. Catholics hold that the church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. Christ, before his ascension into heaven, appointed St. Peter to act as his representative. Hence, to the Bishop of Rome, as head of the church, was given the title Vicar of Christ, representative of the Son of God. Of course, we see nowhere in the Bible where Christ appointed Peter to represent him, to be his head or the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Now, here's the mitre. It's a triple level crown. When a new pope is being coronated, this crown is placed on his head. And the pope is coronated not at St. Peter's Basilica, but at St. John Lateran. That's the place of the Holy See, the, 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 the place of governance of, of the papacy. And uh, notice how this crown is richly um, decked with uh, precious stones and pearls and gold and all of that sort of thing. So the triple level has written at the top, vicarious, in the middle you have filiae, and at the bottom you have day, which is representative of the Son of God, which means he is God of heaven. God of earth, and God of the lower regions. So the Pope claims to be God on earth. And so <clears throat> he has the power to change any of God's laws, to interpret or reinterpret God's laws, and uh, to receive, you know, worshipful homage because he's God on earth. Now, since the man is identified with the beast, the number of the man is the number of the beast, the scripture says, the mark of the beast must also be the mark of the man's authority as the vicar of Christ. And the man is the head of the woman, the church, that rides the beast. We already saw in Daniel 7 that, the, that this little horn exercised power to change God's law. Only the one who claims divine authority could attempt such a thing. Of the change, of the Sabbath, the Sunday, we read, quote, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. And this comes from the office of Cardinal Gibbons through Chancellor H.F. Thomas, November 11, 1895. Here's another statement from the Church of Rome. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day 
and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the holy Catholic Church. Now, this is the boasting of Rome, that she has the power to change God's law. This is according to the prediction of Daniel 7, verse 25, that this power would seek to change God's times and laws. Now, here in the historical statements of Rome, they're confessing and boasting that they are the ones who gave the world a Sunday Sabbath. And that is a mark of her authority in religious matters. So she says the sanctifying of Sunday is her mark of authority. But what does God say about his mark? We're going to see that in a moment. So Rome boasts that the change of the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day of the week is her mark of her religious or divine authority. Sunday sacredness is therefore the beast's mark, but nobody has the mark of the beast yet. We're going to explain that in a moment. So Rome says that Sunday, as made sacred by her, is her mark. Okay? Therefore, it will be on the basis of commanding people to observe the sacredness of Sunday that the beast will be worshipped and by which it will secure worship for the dragon. It's about overthrowing God's authority and that commandment of the 10, which speaks to God as the only God who is deserving of worship because he is the creator. Now, Lucifer is challenging that. All right. I am the God of this world, he says, and I must be worshipped. So everything that God has that identifies him as authority, as, as God and creator, Lucifer is counterfeiting that. And whatever God requires of his children, Lucifer gives a counterfeit set of requirements as well. Now, let's look at the mark of God or the seal or sign of God in contrast to the mark of the beast. In contrast to the mark of the beast, God has his mark of his divine authority. This mark is a sign of his power in creation and redemption, and thus his qualification for the worship of his creatures. Here's what the scripture says. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign or mark between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Exodus 31, verse 13. You can see that also in Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20. So here God posits his, uh, his, uh, his claim to fame, his claim to be worshipped. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. To sanctify is to make holy. In the commandments in um, Exodus uh, chapter 20, God says that we're to keep the Sabbath day because in six days he made the heavens and the earth. That is his, his creatorship, his power in creation. Now in Exodus 31, he adds another reason why we should observe the Sabbath. It is a sign that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, which really means all born again Christians are supposed to observe the seventh-day Sabbath because it testifies to the world that the God we serve is the God who has sanctified us, has saved us. Only Jesus Christ, our, 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 our God the Father, the Holy Spirit, qualifies for that kind of worship. Okay, He is the one who saves us, who redeems us, who sanctifies us. He alone is worthy of our worship. But Lucifer has another um, um, demand. Now, so the creator God, Yahweh, declares that the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath by his people is a sign of our being sanctified or saved or redeemed by him. And as such, he is worthy of our worship. So this is and will be the distinction. Sabbath observance, the mark or the seal or the sign of God. Sunday sacredness, the mark of the beast. 
They said it. The church said it. Not the Seventh-day Baptist, not the Seventh-day Adventist, not the Seventh-day Church of God, not anybody. The Church of Rome has specifically said that the uh, Sunday, change from Saturday to Sunday, is her mark of authority in religious matters. Okay? God says the observance of Sabbath is my mark or sign of my authority in redemption. Okay? So the two powers have made their statements. And we have taken a biblical approach and a historical approach to unraveling what the mark of the beast is and what the mark of God or the seal of God is. Um, God's mark is clearly identified and the church's mark is clearly identified. And we see that the church controls the beast and the beast is a political power. So this political power claims it is a religious power and it has its mark of authority. And if we don't take his mark, then we're going to suffer his wrath. And those who take his mark will in reality suffer the wrath of God also because God is at war with this, the kingdom of darkness. Kingdom of darkness is at war with the kingdom of light. So there's a, a power um, struggle going on here. And ultimately we know who the winner is of this uh, spiritual battle that has been um, you know, uh, raging for so many millennia. Ultimately, it's coming to an end. And those who live in obedience to God's precepts will stand with Christ as conquerors in the, in the latter end. A universal Sunday law will first have to be passed before anyone can be said to have the mark of the beast. The test will be about worship and obedience to God's commandments. Other reasons will be posited as to why we should make Sunday sacred. There will be supporting arguments for Sunday sacredness like climate change, which is already being posited, terrorism, and yes, a created pandemic. They do that too. Arguments for security, environmental protection, economic and social well-being will provide logical buttresses for the call to keep Sunday holy and to punish those who refuse. The current push throughout the European Union for a no-work Sunday on the basis of health and family security will morph into that of a sacred obligation in order to, to secure the blessings of God. The number six was used extensively by the Babylonians, We're talking about the mark and the number of the beast. They also utilized a grid of numbers from one to 36, which when added vertically, horizontally, or diagonally, gave the sum 666. Babylon has historically manifested the character of rebellion against God. So, the 666 that is associated with the spiritual Babylon depicts a spirit of rebellion to the law and worship of Yahweh. Incidentally, um, the, the, the name written on the Pope's mitre, Vicarious Filii Dei, when you add up all the numerical values of uh, the letters that have numerical values, when you add those up, the sum is 666, okay? And the scripture says, it is the number of a man. It is the name of a man, and his number is 666. Okay? Revelation 13, verse 18. Now, those who take the mark in the forehead will be in outright rebellion to God. They will accept the teachings of the man of sin, the beast power, the apostate church, state union, and worship according to his dictates. This group will include Christians and other religious groups who will join with Rome in not accepting the efficacy of the seventh day Sabbath and who will push for state legislation to impose Sunday worship. And this is outright rebellion we're looking at. That happened already in 321 AD when Emperor Constantine passed the first Sunday law, and when in a church council in 325 AD, 
um, there was another law passed to forbid the observance of the seventh day Sabbath. So the first law was to institute Sunday observance, Sunday sacredness. And the second one was to outlaw Sabbath observance. So the same thing is going to happen again in the last days with all the crises around the world, all the, the, um, the, 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 the wars and the famines and the pestilences and the unsettled state of the nations and society and uh, trade wars and economic fallouts and so on. There will be a call for persons to get back to God because of the disasters that are happening. It will be seen that is because we are breaking the Sunday law why these disasters are happening. And especially in Christian America, the call is going to reverberate. And when you know, when, when America does anything, the world follows. You're going to see how the Protestant churches who have forsaken the truth of God's word will unite with the, 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 um, the Catholic church and the state. And together, the union will galvanize the support of all to enforce Sunday observance. And though those persons who, according to conscience, refuse and whose consciences are um, subject to the law of God and to the scriptures will be described or identified as the troublers of the people and they will be targeted for persecution. I'm talking about those Sabbath keepers like ourselves, the remnant church who will um, come under serious persecution as a result of not submitting to the church state legislation to observe a day which has um, as its originator a rebel who uh, has brought sin into the universe. All right, here is a quote from the great controversy, Spirit of Prophecy. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power. And in this work, papists and protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. Now, this was written, the last publication was uh, um, in uh, 1911, but it was written from 1858. And uh, this is the great controversy, published in 1888 and again in 1911 edition. So what this uh, statement is saying is that Right now, we are on the verge of seeing the fulfillment of this prediction here. And uh, since uh, the global warming um, phenomenon uh, several few decades ago, we have been hearing persons calling for, uh, you know, a return to Sunday sacredness. We should um, stop profaning the Lord's day. Uh, persons should get back to church, businesses should close on Sunday so that uh, nature can recuperate and so on and so forth. And people and families can rest and be together. That was God's idea in the beginning when he gave us the Sabbath. But Rome has changed all of that to make it applicable to the Sunday. All right. So we are seeing a legitimate argument for the protection of the environment being accorded to a Sunday sacredness law, okay? Which is a de detraction from what God ordained in the first place. So this is going against God's commands. This is establishing a counterfeit to what God has ordained. Now, those who will take the mark in their right hand seems to point to those who for economic reasons, will be willing to compromise right-hand signifying work or doing things. Keep in mind that the mark of the beast issue will be about God's moral law. It concerns worship. The push for Sunday is not now indicative of worship, except in a kind of a 
veiled pantheistic way, as in the Laudato Si encyclical. But what will change, but that will change as the movement gains traction. Those who have the mark or seal of God in their forehead are characterized by their honoring of God and his precepts in the midst of widespread abomination. And you can see an example of that in Ezekiel 8 and 9, a classic example in Ezekiel 8 and 9, when God's people apostatized and worshipped idols and the sun. It's interesting that it's also presented as worshipping the sun. That is going to be the end time phenomenon as well. And God made a distinction. Those who were faithful to him, they were given a mark in their forehead. And those who were unfaithful, they were slated for execution, for punishment. Same thing is going to happen in the last days. Notice that the saints do not have a mark in their right hand, only in their forehead. This signifies that it is not by working that the saints obtain God's favor. It's a faith grace matter. We are saved by grace through faith. The mind is under the control of the Holy Spirit. The character of Christ is imparted to the saints through grace. It's not something that we work for. All right. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, received the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, received the seal of God. Great Controversy 501. So my friends, we are seeing the developments. We are seeing um, things being put into place right now to um, bring this matter into being into reality, where ultimately people will have to make a decision as to whether or not they're going to serve God and receive his approbation and his um, blessing, or they are going to uh, take the mark of rebellion and opposition to God. All of us will have to make a decision. It's obedience or disobedience. It's accepting the mark or receiving the seal of God. Every single person on the planet will be brought to a point of decision. But the wonderful thing about God's grace is that he will not allow any person to accept the mark of the beast in ignorance. He will allow persons to come to an understanding of what the issues are. Hence, the three angels of Revelation 14, the first angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth and, uh, you know, declaring the judgment of God. And the, the, the angel of Revelation 18 coming down with great glory, engulfing the earth with the glory of God's truth. And uh, which means God is going to allow the truth of his word to engulf the planet. All right, everybody will hear, everybody will know what the issues are. Nobody will take the mark in ignorance. Those who hear, well, not just those, and when I say those, I mean everyone will hear, then persons will have to make a decision. Am I going to um, ally myself with Jesus Christ and suffer persecution from the dragon? Or am I going to take the mark and uh, ally myself with the dragon and then suffer God's wrath, the seven last plagues. Either way, we're going to have to face some challenges. But in taking God's seal, we are assured of God's protection and ultimate deliverance. In taking the mark of rebellion against God, we're also <laughs> assured 
of ultimate punishment and destruction. Every person will have to make a decision. This is a crucial matter. It is the final test that is coming upon the earth. It's about worship. Am I going to worship God according to his commandments, according to his word? Or am I going to take you know, the easy path, the easy way for economic expediency in order to be able to buy and sell and to enjoy you know, a good life? Uh, not realizing or even realizing that ultimately everything will be destroyed, but I don't care. This is just my choice. So everybody will have to make a decision as to who he or she will worship. And I know that you all will make the right decision. We all will make the right decision to obey God and to keep his commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Are there any questions from our participants tonight? No question? Is everything clear? Everything is clear, Pastor. We appreciate it so much. Amen. Amen. I do have a, an, a, an observation. It just came to my mind. Um, we can keep the Sabbath till the cows come home, the right Sabbath, if we are not converted in heart. When the mark of the beast is being issued, will we not take it then? Well, the truth is we can't keep the Sabbath unless we're converted. <laughs> Any attempt at keeping a holy requirement must be that the individual is holy as well. An unholy person cannot observe a holy requirement, holy commandment at all. It's not possible. It doesn't matter how he tries. It will be a legalistic approach. Right. I appreciate that. Um, and so the danger that is coming to my mind is that we may think that we are holy, <laughs> you know, that we're keeping the Sabbath holy. We may even be so strict. We drive our friends and children and family members crazy, you know, and we do that when we're not truly converted. You know, so um, I know everything follows in a train of conversion, you know, and so um, yeah. Satan, Satan, I believe, provides distractions. He will use me to, to distract me if mm -hmm. by God's grace, I'm not being vigilant and sober in his word. So um, it just came to my mind and I thought I might throw it out there. What it's worth that, you know, we have to pray for yes. that personal conversion. We need to understand that ultimately there's going to be a division. There'll be two classes of people on the earth. Those who are pretending or those who are hypocritical in the church will ultimately take their side with those who are on the, the beast side. Um, only those who are truly genuine will receive the seal of God's approval, the full impress of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the hypocrites in the church will be shaken out. Uh, we have heard of the shaking and we see the, um, the parable of the, the, the goats and the sheep, the wheat and the tears. Ultimately, uh, and the, the parable of the 10 virgins, the foolish and the wise, all of this separating takes place before Jesus Christ comes. Okay? So those who are not genuinely converted will ultimately find it convenient to take their stand with those who are against God's commandment. They can't deal with the suffering and the persecution. And because they're not anchored in Jesus, it will be convenient for them to take the other side. So there will be two clear, distinct groups of people in the final analysis, in the final crisis. Amen. Appreciate it, Pastor. Okay. No other question. Okay, let's do our little quiz. Um, we identified seven um, marks, identifying marks of the woman in Revelation 17. 
could anyone list or say one or two of those identifying marks that we, we mentioned? She's arrayed in purple and scarlet. Okay. That's, that's the woman arrayed in purple and scarlet. Okay. Is there another identifying mark? She's on seven hills. Okay. She is located. That's a geographical location. Seven hills. And there's one church power, which is a state uh, city, which is located on seven hills. And that's Rome. Okay. And um, what is the meaning of the description of her being drunk or drunken with the blood of the saints? That she's a persecuting power. Persecuting power. Okay. And uh, um, finally, um, the, the little, true or false, the little horn is the same as the beast power and the woman of Revelation 13 and 17. The little horn of Daniel 7 is the same power as the beast or woman of chapters 13 and 17 of Revelation. Is that true or false? False. Oh. The correct answer is true. <laughs> the little horn power ultimately took control of the beast and that little horn power is a papacy. It controls the political power and that uh, the woman is, is also the church power, the papacy, which rides the beast, which is controlled. So um, the three descriptions are of the same um, power that we are talking about. Okay, I think I misunderstood, Mister. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Okay, so no other question? Any, any point that stands out? Anybody wants to iterate any point? Vince? Welcome. I see you are the, the lone uh, pilgrim who has <laughs> remained with us today. Um, the point that you made about the, the number being the number of a man, you know, I appreciate that point, especially because there are other names of people who, uh, whose numeric value add up to 666, including Ellen G. White. But because she's a woman, and it right. says a man. However, the, the, the names that add up to 666, those names had to be either Latinized or Hellenized in order to, for, the, for, the, for that to be. Um, the name must be in its generic state. You don't have to convert it to a, a Latin um, name or a Greek name. It must be within its generic state. So if it's English, it must be added according to English principles. If it's Latin, it must be done according to Latin laws and principles. So you can't switch from Latin to Greek and then, you know, and, and do that. So if Ellen White's number add up to 666, it's because they have Latinized or something like that, her name, because uh, um, we don't have any such principle in English and in numerical value in English for the numbers. So that, that is not, you know, a, a genuine approach to the, to the, to the identifying of the, of the number or the man. Okay, appreciate it. Just in case anyone wanted to say she's okay. <laughs> okay. All right, we, we can pray now um, to close our study and then we'll turn over to Brother Aaron. Father in heaven, we thank you for our study tonight. Uh, we didn't have as many persons online as we usually do, but we pray that those who will later watch it um, on the YouTube channel will be edified 
and we'll have a clearer understanding as to what these things mean. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to make sure that our relationship with you is intact, that uh, having preached to others, we ourselves will not become a castaway. Thank you so much for the revelations that you give us in your word to prepare us for the challenges that lie ahead. Do bless us now. Bless us. Give us a good week. Keep us safe in your love. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We appreciate that study, Pastor Wright. So invigorating, so enlightening and edifying that we want the seal of God and not the mark of the beast. In the chat is the link for this evening's study. And also please remember, out of reverence for God, we invite you to please remain with us if possible until we dismiss after our closing hymn. Please join us, Lord willing, next on Wednesday morning at six Eastern time and Jamaican time and five central for AHA at prayer on this same Zoom platform. And please make sure you like and subscribe and also let your contacts know about this study. Then Lord willing, join us next on Sunday at six Eastern, five Central and six Jamaica time for AHA at study on this same Zoom platform. Our closing hymn, which is what the Lord tells us to do, go into the world and preach the gospel. Number 378, please mute and sing along this closing hymn. Preach my gospel, saith the Lord. Bid the whole world my grace receive. Ye shall be saved who trust my word. And the condemned who disbelieve. And the condemned who Amen. Pastor Wright, please offer 
the closing prayer. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and to be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee his peace. Amen. 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 God's richest blessings. Maranatha, God's richest blessings. Appreciate it, Pastor, right? Amen. God bless you all. God bless you, Pastor, right?